So I thought I'd do a quick video today about how to get the most out of your QCX or QCX Plus kit and in the future your QCX Mini, um, all being the same circuit and uh, firmware performance, everything just a different mechanical implementation. So we're assembling typically every week uh, here something like between 10 and 15 assembled QCX Plus kits. Um, and they all come to me to test them. So this is a good opportunity to show you how to get the most out of your QCX Plus. So this is uh, a kit which has been assembled by our technician and is destined for a customer in America, in North Carolina. It's a 30 meter kit with a TCXO option and the enclosure option. So opening it up, we see here is the uh, QCX Plus and it's all now ready for me to have a look at and uh, test properly and align properly. So first I'll take off the lid and um, I make first a visual inspection. I have here my trusty headset which is helping me to see anything and just check to see that there are no components missing, no obvious faults, um, really really obvious things. Um, it looks good to me. So we're actually going to assume that it's working properly. Um, this is not a troubleshooting video, this is more of a tune-up video, how to get the most out of your QCX Plus. So you see here on the back I've got the RF power paddle and ear audio output. I'm going to make use of all of those. So I'm going to plug in my power supply, my dummy load, and my Palm Radio Pico Paddle and my earphones. Now let's see what we have. So I have at my disposal here a 0 to 30 volt, 0 to 20 amp power supply, which I'm just adjusting for 12.0 volts. That's where I do my setup. Later I'm going to change it to 13.8 volts to measure the power output there as well. And I have here also a, a Siglent SDS1202X E 200 MHz digital storage oscilloscope. This was a prize from the sponsors of the Homebrew Heroes Award, um, Siglent. So that's been very useful this year. And in particular, I've set this up so that the Trace 1 here, I'm particularly interested in this peak to peak value here, and that's going to show me the uh, power output of the transmitter section. So let's switch it on and see what we have. Well, the first thing to do is to make sure that the display is set up correctly. Now the technician actually done this basic test already um, but typically when you first power up you'll see something like a very washed out or blank screen more like that perhaps some very weak lettering visible in the background and you now have to adjust the contrast potentiometer, which is just at the top left here behind the display, and adjust that. I go just about to where I can see the squares. If you take it too far, it gets very ugly like that, but go just about to where the squares disappear, and that's the perfect place for it. If you go too far, it gets the contrast gets a bit washed out, then the display is also a bit slow to update and respond, and that's quite irritating. So just adjust it to just about get rid of those squares in the background like that. Now on the video it still shows the squares, but in, in real life they're not showing. Now the next thing to do is select the band of interest. This is a 30 meter radio, so I turn the rotary encoder here and press the select button, and you see now I'm on 30 meters. Now, the very, very important thing to do here is if you're using the TCO XO option, you must change the reference frequency manually because the GPS is not going to do that for you. So you go through to the alignment menu, menu 8, and you go to 8.5 and just change that to 25 megahertz. The default is 27.004, which is appropriate for when you have the crystal, but of course not when you have the 25 megahertz TCXO. So then come out of there and uh, take you back to the front screen. The other thing I do is switch off the CW decoder, just because I like to supply these uh, assembled QCX kits in a 
standard way. So I just switch off the CW decoder on reception and transmission and I leave it on for the editing because that can be quite useful. So now the next thing I do is test the power output. So here at the back of the radio I've got a uh, dummy load plugged in in an Altoids tin. This dummy load is a QRP Labs dummy load kit and I've taken a screwed a ground connection here and just a wire coming out where I can connect a scope probe. Then I've got a resistor on this end just to feed through with an attenuated version of their output power to another BNC connector on the far end which I can connect a spectrum analyzer to without fear of blowing the input of the spectrum analyzer. Now the oscilloscope is set up with 10 volts per vertical division and 50 nanoseconds per horizontal division. Now you can see here I have my uh, Palm Radio Pico Kia on its nice heavy pedestal. Now when I just give that a squeeze, now bear in mind I'm in straight key mode still at the moment, but just squeeze one of the paddles and see how, see how high I get on the power output. There, 17.6 volts peak to peak. I'm just going to switch off the second channel here, which we don't need for this. 17.6 volts peak to peak. So now I've got my trusty old calculator. This calculator is actually 33 years old, still going very strong. Now I'll type in that peak-to-peak uh, -peak voltage reading. I square it and I divide by 400 and that gives me the power output. 0 0.77 watts. Now at this stage, if this is what you got, you'd be thinking, that guy cheated me. This is supposed to be a 5 watt radio and here I've got 0 0.77 watts output. That's awful. So the next thing we have to do is fix that and find out what's wrong. Now this is all about the power amplifier section and particularly low pass filter. You can see here this is L L4 which is the resonant circuit of the Class E power amplifier. L3, L2 and L1 are the three inductors in the low pass filter. Now it's very tempting for people to blame the components and this happens a lot but in reality the components are very very seldom to blame. We're now using all of our toroids from kitsandparts.com in the US um, supplied directly by Micrometals to Diz and he supplies them to us and we're using for the capacitors here we're using NP0 uh, capacitors by Vichet, direct from Digikey Digi in the US. They're very, very high quality components and they're very, very seldom to blame. What is the important thing is that you have a lot of inductance variation by the winding, by the way these coils are wound, whether they're wound over the whole circumference, whether they're spread evenly, how tightly they're wound, there's variations in material on the, in, on the core itself. There's all sorts of variables involved which will change the inductance and will change the characteristic of the low pass filter. On top of that, the Class E power amplifier is not likely to have exactly a 50 ohm output anyway, and so you can, you can actually get some impedance transformation as well. So even the exact inductance values that are theoretically predicted, if they were hit exactly, they still wouldn't lead to the, the best possible power output. And so even when you measure with an inductance meter, you're going to have doubts about your inductance meter accuracy and so on. And so I really think the best way to do it is just to play around with it and see if you can get the power output improved. Now, what I, what I would always say is when you squeeze the turns together, tighter together, you're increasing the inductance. And when you spread them out, you're decreasing the inductance. So what you can do is spread them out and see how the power output changes. Remember that it was 17.6 volts peak to peak to start with. So I always start with L3, the end which is closest to the power amplifier, and I'll spread out those turns, turns first. And as I go, I'll just spread them a little bit and then a little bit more and see how the power output changes. And if I notice that the power output is maximum when the turns are completely evenly spread out, that's the minimum inductance, and that tells me that probably I should take off a turn or two. And if I do so, then I'll be able to um, reduce the inductance further and probably get a better impedance match or a better passband characteristic. 
so you can see also that whoever wound this coil didn't actually uh, wind it particularly precisely with with the um, turns spread out thoroughly anyway and so you're going to see the very dramatic change in power output as I manage to optimize these toroids. I always look for at least 4 watts power output with a 12 volt supply. So I'm going to try to spread those out a little bit with the screwdriver, try and get them maximally spread out and usually I find that when they're maximally spread out the power output is increased and then I take off two turns and that seems to do it about right on 20 meter and 30 meter bands which are particularly difficult to do. On 40 meter band it doesn't usually require any changes at all but on 20 and 30 meter and remember this is a 30 meter radio it does. So here you can see on L3 I have spread out the turns to the maximum now let's see what that does to the power output here. 22.4 volts peak to peak, so it went up quite considerably from 17.6. Now the next thing I've done is try to spread the turns as much as possible on L4 here, which is the Class E resonant uh, inductor, and we'll see what difference that makes. Twenty one point six, so that actually things went down a little bit there, but only slightly. I'm not going to worry too much about that. Usually it's best if these are if the L four turns are spread as much as possible. So now I'm going to remove two of the turns from the L three inductor, which in my experience on the twenty meter and thirty meter bands is what gives the best result. Now to do this, please remember to turn off the power supply. Um, I have previously forgotten to do that, and even if you switch the power off on the on-off button at the front of the radio, there's still power coming in here on the connector. And it only takes a slip screwdriver or something to short things out and uh, ruin something somewhere. So I actually cheat a little bit now by leaving the board mounted inside the enclosure and just removing two turns from the top. Um, so I just pull out one of the wires, and I typically use the wire which is closest to L2 side of the toroid, and just pull that out. Now, it is quite fiddly to do it when it's in place and not take, not take off the uh, enclosure, but uh, I'm lazy and I have lots of other things to do, and as I said, we're making two or three of these per day and I need to minimise the amount of time that I spend setting them up. So I've just unwound two turns. Now cut off the extra piece of enamelled wire. Quickly tin the end of the new end of the enamelled wire toroid winding and I'll position that on top of the pad on the board and again this is cheating because really you should solder it through the pad on the board but I'm just soldering it to the top and it does work and it saves a lot of time. So there we go. Um, now I've removed two turns and I need to spread out the turns again to reduce the inductance. And the important point here is if it turns out that I've removed too many turns and it would be better to have them inductance back up a bit then I can just squeeze together the turns of the toroid and, and the inductance will go up again. So everything will be sorted out quite nicely. Right, so let's see what effect that has. So let me just switch on the power again. And here's the radio. Now you can see on the L3 toroid here, I've spread out the turns as much as I can. There are now two less turns than there were. And let's see 
what effect that has on the power output. 34.4 volts peak to peak. Very nice. Now 34.4 volts and squared divided by 400 is just under uh, 3 watts power output. Um, now so we've gone from 0 0.77 watts power output to just under 3 watts power output just by adjusting the inductance of L3. So now we'll try some more with the other inductors as well. And what I tend to do next is see if any squeezing helps on L2. L2 is the one here in the middle. And you can see that uh, L2 is kind of bunched up already. And so I'll try just adjusting it a little bit, opening it, keying the radio, squeezing it a bit more and see if I can find a way to increase the power output. So what I found after some adjustment just by a trial and error is that actually spacing out the turns here gives an improvement in power output, not squeezing them any further together. And when there's quite a wide range of uh, gap that you can leave here in this particular case and the power output doesn't really change very much. Now the power output that I've got now is um, just 39.6 volts peak to peak just under 4 watts and if you if you remember I said I was looking for about 4 watts with 12 volt power supply so I'm already very close just by having adjusted those two inductors L3 and L2 but we've still got L1 to go and as you can see that's the state of L1 at the moment let me see by squeezing and compressing the turns on that one what difference I can make This is how my L1 ended up. Um, L1 is this, this one here at the back. And you can see the power output now. Uh, I have 41.2 or 41.6 volts peak to peak. Now uh, 41.6 volts peak to peak is 4.3 watts. So it's definitely a major improvement. Now I'm just going to go back over the other toroids and see if I can adjust those any more to get any better than that. Well, I didn't really find any improvement. The uh, 41.6 volts peak to peak is as good as I could get. No further tweaking of these other inductors helped anything. So just to summarize what we've done, on first power up, there's a power output of 0 0.77 watts, which appeared very, very low for what's supposed to be a 5 watt radio. The first thing I did was spread the turns on L4 so that they were nice and evenly spaced. I always do that with L4 and then don't bother to fiddle with it any further. Next I spread the turns on L3, the closest to the power output uh, of the amplifier, and noted the quite significant increase in power output. So I removed two turns from L3 and left it like that. Typically on 40 meters that's not necessary, but I find on 20 and 30 meters it often helps to remove two turns from L3. Next I tried spreading and, and uh, compressing the turns on L2 here and found again that that increased the power output and then finally also optimised L1 here on the right. And what I ended up with was 41.6 volts peak to peak 
and that equates to about 4.3 watts power output. So I've gone from 0 0.77 watts to 4.3 watts with a just fiddling with the inductors and nothing else is required just fiddling with those inductors. Well you might be thinking I've changed the characteristic of the low pass filter and it's no longer a straight line with zero attenuation and a sharp cut off. Maybe you're right, maybe there's now a peak, um, I don't know. I'm not going to bother to um, take it out of the circuit and uh, evaluate it on its own. In any case, that's not necessarily going to be a valid comparison anyway because we don't know that the output impedance of the Class E power amplifier is definitely exactly 50 ohms. So nothing is certain, but what we do know is we increase the power from 0 0.77 watts to 4.3 watts. Now you might be worried that we might have changed the cutoff of the filter and maybe it's not getting enough harmonic attention now, attenuation now. So next I'll try hooking it up to the spectrum analyzer and seeing if we can uh, check out the uh, harmonic content. As you'll notice the spectrum analyzer is somewhat buried here so I'm going to have to see if I can unbury it a bit to find my way down through the pile of stuff. There we go. Um, now I'm going to connect it to the spectrum analyzer port of the dummy load in this Altoids tin. Remember there's an attenuator in there. Most spectrum analyzers, if you give them 5 watts, they're going to be very unhappy indeed and you will immediately blow the input amplifier to the spectrum analyzer. Well, I did eventually manage to find the other end of this BNC cable and follow it all the way over here and uh, get it plugged into the Altoids tin here. This is very difficult to do with one hand, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a recording of a trace and then we'll be able to look at it in detail. So here is the spectrum analyzer screen and you can see I've set it up for a 0 to 100 megahertz sweep and I've put a marker there at the fundamental and it measures plus 37.55 dBm. Now I'd already put in a reference offset on the spectrum analyzer such that it uh, accounts properly for the attenuation that I've got built into the dummy load so that the peak power that you're measuring there is, is approximately correct and 37 dBm would be 5 watts so um, it's slightly over reading the compensation factor may not be exact but don't worry about that what we're really looking at is the level of the harmonic content. Now you can see here is the second harmonic and here is the third harmonic and I can actually um, play around with the markers to get a direct measurement of those. So here I've set up a marker on the fundamental and on the second and the third harmonic and I can actually turn on the list here and you can see that the, the uh, attenuation is really quite good. The second harmonic is 54 decibels down on the fundamental and the third harmonic is 66 decibels down on the, on the fundamental. Now all of the other harmonics have disappeared completely below the noise floor. The noise floor here is about 70 dB down from the fundamental and so basically we've got uh, a worst harmonic is the second at 54 decibels below the carrier. This is a very very clean output and there's nothing at all to worry about. So all of our adjustments that we've made to the low pass filter here have certainly not damaged its performance and effectiveness at attenuating harmonics. So there you have it, that's the primary concern of many people, um, the low power output, particularly on the 20 and 30 meter bands. Um, as I said, 40 meters is usually quite easy to get a good power output, often on 40 meters by fiddling with the toroids, you can get more than 5 watts at 12 volts, um, certainly by 13.8 volts you've got well over 5 watts. So that, that really shows um, how to get good power output even on 20 and 30 meters. We went from 0 0.77 watts up to 4.3 watts power output, all with a 12 volt supply. So to summarize with uh, power output optimization, firstly, don't assume that there's anything wrong with the components. 
there's at least a 99% probability the components are perfectly fine. At least since the beginning of 2020, we stopped using any other suppliers. We're now only using DigiKey Vichy capacitors for NP0 uh, or C0G type capacitors, low loss RF dielectric capacitors for the low pass filters. We're also only using kitsandparts.com for supply of micrometals, toroids. All of that comes from the US. Uh, several times per year so these are the best quality components you can buy so don't assume there's anything wrong with the components do assume that there's a lot of variation in winding style and that has a big effect on the inductance and you do need to make adjustments to be able to get the best of the power output um, secondly don't assume that you only have to remove terms um, there are many times where I have found that squeezing together the terms which increases the inductance um, is the optimum way to get the higher power output. Um, particularly, I find L3, you need to remove a couple of turns for 20 and 30 meters. 40 meters, I don't usually remove any turns for L3. Um, L2 typically doesn't need any turns removed. Um, particularly, even on 40 meter versions, it seems to give best power output when squeezed as tightly as possible together and uh, typically 20 and 30 meters is some optimum point where the power output is maximized. Um, L1 similarly doesn't normally need to have any turns removed, um, it's just a matter of spreading them or compressing them. 20 and 30 meters is harder to get the higher power output and typically does start off with a much lower output. Uh, 40 meters is quite easy to get the rated power output. Um, 60 meters and 80 meters also gets more hard. Uh, so it, it's uh, really 40 meters is easy, but when you go away from that in either direction, it gets harder. Nevertheless, as I showed, you can get a really drastic improvement in performance just by uh, adjusting those uh, inductors in the low pass filter. Now I've adjusted the power supply for 13.8 volts, which is a very typical voltage used. And let's see the power output now. That's 48.4 volts peak to peak. And 48.4 volts peak to peak into 50 ohms is 5.8 watts power output. So certainly at 13.8 volts, it's well in excess of the 5 watts specification. The so specification is actually that it should achieve 5 watts by 16 volt supply. So you can see that, um, you know, it's really quite easy to exceed the specification without too much trouble. We've also got the um, reverse voltage polarity protection diode still installed and that drops about 13, uh, sorry, about 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 volts. If you really wanted a bit more power output you could also bypass that, um, sacrificing the safety that it provides. Um, this is the diode here, the 1N5819 diode here. So the next thing to do is to align the receiver section and there are four adjustments here. The first is the bandpass filter trimmer capacitor here, uh, C1, and then there are the three trimmer potentiometers. Each is a 24 turn trimmer potentiometer, which is the IQ balance, the low phase adjustment and the high phase adjustment. And by adjusting all of these, we're expecting to both peak the bandpass filter made from the T1 transformer here and also peak the unwanted sideband cancellation. And we should be able to get at least 50 or 60 dB of unwanted sideband cancellation by adjusting those. Now, it, it's quite nice when you're adjust, adjusting the bandpass filter to use a non-metallic screwdriver. I used to have a nice ceramic screwdriver, but of course I broke the tip off it and um, I'm not sure where to buy those now, I'll probably find one. But now I'm using a screwdriver that came with the oscilloscope for the adjustments of the probes of the oscilloscope. So it has a very small um, metal blade on it that doesn't disrupt anything too much. In any case, the, the um, metal uh, screw here on the trimmer capacitor is grounded anyway, so it shouldn't really make any difference. Um, but it's just my good habit to use a non-metallic screwdriver or certainly a very small piece of metal if possible. So for this adjustment, we're going to come into menu 8, the alignment menu, and we will go to 8.7 first, the bandpass filter. Now you can hear the tone. Um, this is with quite a low volume. If I turn that up, that gets really loud, and that's just the earphone lying on the desk here. 
the peak bandpass filter reading, and this is very important, the peak bandpass filter reading does not depend on the volume control, so it's annoying, let's just turn it down. Now I will try turning that trimmer, and it's a little bit stiff, don't think it's stuck, it may look stuck, but it's not, and you will see that I can find a nice peak here, um, around the middle of the 8 scale here. That's the peak of the bandpass filter. It's quite normal as you turn to find multiple peaks. Um, one of them will be the, the one that you want to choose which is better than the others. And now the other important thing to, to note here is that this trimmer capacitor should be not either fully open or not either fully closed. I'm not sure if you can see here but this metallic plate here this is the metallic side here on the left and there's a fixed metallic plate which is this bottom part here and so you can see that it's not it's it's about here one third open not fully open and not fully closed if it was fully or open or fully closed then refer to the manual you will need to add or remove turns from this main winding of T1 but that doesn't usually happen on 20 or 30 or 40 meter bands that's much more common on the 60 or 80 meter band versions um, this is a 30 meter band so it's quite typical that I don't need to make any adjustments whatsoever to the turns on T1 I just have to adjust this trimmer capacitor now what you see here on the screen um, the graph that you see um, the, the bar chart showing uh, a value of 8 here in the top right is, is quite typically what I see on 20 or 30 meter versions of the QCX Plus. You, you do this by the way with the dummy load plugged in. It does make a slight difference and ensures that you've got a 50 ohm load which is pretty much what the antenna is hopefully going to be in the end. So now we come to the tricky part, turn one turn more clockwise and now we're going to adjust the IQ balance, which is 8.8, .8, the low phase adjustment, which is 8.9, and the high phase adjustment, which is 10. Now probably some people see this 0 or 1 and they worry about that. It's very important to realise this setting is dependent on the volume setting. So you must choose a volume setting which gets the... Um, gets the number here to something like 11 or 12. Don't go for 13. If you go for 13, the analog to digital converter is being overloaded and it, it won't be able to show anything. Um, it'll just overload so you won't be able to see where the peaks and, and nulls are. So go for a value of 11 to start with. Now remember that um, you've got three adjustments here. This is the IQ balance which is menu 8.8 .8. This is 8.9, the low phase adjustment, and this is 8.10, the high phase adjustment. And you do have to go backwards and forwards between these, and what you're looking for is a minimum. And you sometimes have to go backwards and forwards a large number of times, and each time it changes the other values, and eventually you're home in on a value where it won't make any difference, and you, that's where the optimum value is. So I typically come to um, first... 8.9 the low phase adjustment and I find normally I have to turn this trimmer clockwise a few turns so let me just do that now if I can put the blade of the screwdriver in so I'm turning clockwise now and as I turn you can see that value is going down Look at the value here in the top right of the screen. And you'll see it go down to a certain point, and then it will start going up again. You've gone too far, so go back. And you can see it was at a minimum value. It was 7 here in the top right. Now, once you've done that, I turn the volume to about halfway point. So the white line is at the top here. That's the halfway point, and that's normally a good place to adjust these values. Now go to the high phase adjustment. It didn't seem to need very much adjustment. The minimum there was without very much turning in this case. They're always different. Every single one is different. Um, and now you see it's also changed when I go back to the low phase adjustment. It's changed this setting as well. Now 
before anything else I should also adjust the IQ balance. This is the amplitude balance between the IQ and Q paths. You see if I turn that anti-clockwise it makes a huge difference here. When I get to a minimum value somewhere around 9 here on the top right. So now I can go back to the low phase adjustment and play around with that. You can see I've got it down to 7 here. High phase adjustment, now I will have to re-trim that one. Again, I'm getting a minimum somewhere in the, the 7 range. And this is quite typical. I very typically see um, a value of 7 or 8 as the minimum when the volume is on halfway mark like this. But now you can see when I go back to the low phase adjustment, it's it's gone up again to 8. So I have to keep going backwards and forwards until I can get them both on the minimums. And you will find it jumps around a little bit, there's not something to worry about. Now you see when I go back to high, this has also come back up to 9, so I need to turn that one some more and get it down. Now this time you see it stayed on 7, but it's the bar itself is a little bit higher. Too far. So about halfway on the 7 is the lowest I can get the low phase adjustment. And as I go backwards and forwards and get f closer and closer to the optimum configuration, the changes are getting less and less. The adjustments are very, very small now. And you can see this time when I've gone back to the low phase adjustment, there was also almost no movement whatsoever. See, now there's no, no change. When I went backwards and forwards between the low and the high, after adjusting one of them, there was no change. So now that's the optimum position. Now I'll go back again to IQ balance and just see if this is also at the optimum position. Slight improvement there, a little bit more anti-clockwise. And again, that's about as good as I can get. And the number seven here in the top right six seven eight all of them are quite reasonable now if i was to go do a huge analysis and uh, carefully tune a signal generator across the passband i would be able to find a plot of the unwanted sideband cancellation and i would expect to see it somewhere in the 50 or 60 db sideband cancellation range at least by the way i was wondering why the bar during these measurements seem to be jumping around so much and I actually found out the ground um, crocodile clip here of the oscilloscope had come off so um, there was some grounding problem there that was causing that to jump around more than I had expected so now I've found that I'm quite um, happy to have an explanation. So what I do now I'm going to go up to 8.13 and I will plug in my QLG1 GPS. Here is the QLG1 GPS in a 3D printed enclosure. Now at the moment the red power LED is on and the yellow data LED is on and it's looking for satellite lock. Now the connection for the GPS here is actually just a, a four pin header which I have loosely uh, plugged into the corresponding pads on the board here. They're not soldered in, uh, they're just touching randomly and the weight of the cable is enough to make contact um, so that's quite a reasonable way to quickly make this now what we see here is a information screen on the on this on the display here um, what we're waiting for before we do the next step is we're waiting to get a fix a 3d fix which you can see here when you've got a and you've got that means the data is valid and you've got the 3d fix that means you can proceed to the next step because you've got the one pulse per second signal. You can also see here over on the GPS itself, we've now got the one PPS green LED 
flashing and so that uh, again signals we've got a satellite fix. Now having a satellite fix here in the lab um, with its steel framed roof and all the equipment around um, just goes to show how sensitive that QLG1 uh, GPS unit is and uh, doesn't need to be outdoors, doesn't need to have a good view of the sky, kind of works anywhere. So now we've uh, now we've got that uh, good display there and uh, we've got the one pulse per second coming in nicely. We've got a GPS lock. <coughs> the next thing we do is go to menu 8.12 now in about four or five seconds it will calibrate the system oscillator which is the 20 megahertz crystal of the microprocessor. Once that's done, and I've made a note of that value, um, just because I make a calibration certificate here to give to the uh, customer, now I go to menu 8.11, and it will similarly calibrate the uh, reference oscillator, which is the 25 MHz TCXO. Now this one happened to be spot on 25 MHz, but I, they are sometimes a few hertz off in either direction, um, I've never seen this TCXO be more than 5 Hz off. Um, normally it's within just a few Hz, and so um, it's a very impressive TCXO. So now I'm finished with the GPS, and I'll just disconnect the GPS. And the calibration is now complete. The only last thing I do is make a measurement of the power output at 12 volts and 13.8 volts for the certificate. So I've filled out the calibration certificate here with the values that were measured of the system, uh, 20 megahertz system oscillator and the TCXO reference for the synthesizer into 30 meter unit and the serial number is 11,049. Uh, yes, there really have been more than 11,000 QCX and QCX plus kits sold since August 2017. The final powers that I measured here were 4.6 watts at 12 volts and 6.4 watts at 13.8 volts. Very respectable numbers. And uh, this is going to the customer for 38566, his order number 38566. So that's the calibration certificate. So now that's all nicely finished and adjusted and aligned and we've made the nice calibration certificate. Just finish it off by Putting the lid back on, and remember there's a U groove on one side and an I groove on the other side, and you can't do it one way, it has to only be one way round. Um, so we'll just put those screws back on. So there we are, this is now all ready, all ready to go, it will be shipped tomorrow by FedEx Express TNT and uh, that's, it's all been nicely put some bubble wrap in there and that will be off tomorrow and uh, he should get it about four business days later. So to summarise, we've gone through um, getting the most of the power output out of the QCX Plus. I used a 30 meter version. 20 and 30 meters are traditionally the hardest to get the rated power output from. And uh, so showed you how I went really from 0 0.77 watts to almost 5 watts at 12 volt supply just by playing with the inductors. So. You don't need a spectrum analyzer. I just use the spectrum analyzer here to show you that uh, filling with the low pass filter hasn't damaged the harmonic content. Um, you don't need an oscilloscope. I'm using my oscilloscope because it's the most accurate way of measuring power that I have. But for relative power measurements, you could even just use the onboard tool in the QCX Plus itself. Normally, it takes me about 10 or 15 minutes to set up and calibrate the QCX Plus kit. Uh, if there's nothing goes wrong, of course, if it needs fault finding, then it's a different um, game altogether. But just for adjustment and alignment, it's only a 10 or 15 minute job. The results are very, very good. Um, very good sideband cancellation and very good power output. So I hope you found it useful and thanks for watching. Bye bye now.